you have your Bible, and I hope that you do, uh, we are <clears throat> wrapping up our study of the New Testament. <clears throat> We've reached the book of Revelation, and we're kind of in our Christmas uh, series of, of this great study through the New Testament, and I don't know that I've ever preached Christmas messages from the book of Revelation before, but I'm excited about it. And uh, this morning, I want to share with you about uh, living between the two advents. Today, we find ourselves living between two great advents. At Christmas, we celebrate joyfully the first advent of Jesus Christ, the first arrival of Christ. That's what Christmas is all about. We celebrate His advent. That means arrival. Uh, He arrived right on time. And at the same time here at Christmas, we eagerly await and anticipate His second arrival. Uh, We're waiting right now on Jesus Christ to come back. We're waiting on the second advent. And when you think about the two advents, uh, they bear similarities. Uh, One of the similarities is they both have prophetic prediction. Just like there were many prophecies about the first coming of Jesus Christ, uh, there were many that told us uh, exactly what would happen at that first coming. And, and there are likewise many prophecies that relate to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, another thing that's similar is that these prophecies have precise fulfillment. Uh, the, it, it's amazing how the first prophecies of Jesus were precisely fulfilled. Uh, even though they seemed impossible and they seem miraculous. They were exactly fulfilled. Like uh, Isaiah 7 verse 14. In Isaiah 7, Isaiah said that, behold, a virgin will be with child. A virgin will be with child and, and she will have a baby and you will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. I mean, that's a, when you think about that prophecy, that's an amazing prophecy. A virgin birth that would result in a child that would be uh, the God-man, that would be God with us. And, and we know that that prophecy was exactly fulfilled, that Mary uh, was a virgin who had never been with a man. And, and when she married Joseph, she, did not, she was never with Joseph until after she had a child. That prophecy was fulfilled. We also know that in Isaiah, the Bible told us that in Isaiah 9, verse 6 through 7, that, 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 that a child would be born and that the government would be upon his shoulders, that his name would be called Mighty Counselor, uh, the Everlasting God, the Prince of Peace, and upon the throne of David, he would reign forever and ever. We, we are told that Jesus would be of the lineage of, of David. And, and, of course, we know that the prophecy was exactly fulfilled, that Jesus was born with an earthly father, Joseph, who was of the lineage of of King David. He was set on the throne of David. We're also told a very obscure prophecy in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. uh, He said, O you little town of Bethlehem, of you one will come forth whose goings are of old. And, And so we are told that it would be in the little town of Bethlehem that Jesus Christ would be born. And of course, we know the Christmas story and how remarkable it was that Jesus happened to be born at Bethlehem because Mary and Joseph lives in, lived in Nazareth, right? Uh, they lived a long way from Bethlehem. But God used a pagan king, a pagan Roman emperor, uh, Caesar Augustus, who decreed that the whole world would have to go back to their town of lineage to, to be taxed. And that caused a pregnant girl to have to take this long journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem so that that prophecy likewise would be literally exactly fulfilled. When we think about the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ, uh, those similarities are, are things that we can count on today. There are many prophecies about the return of Christ. And those prophecies are going to be literally fulfilled. We've seen some of those before our very eyes. 
Uh, We have seen the rebirth of Israel as a nation. That's a pretty remarkable thing for a nation to have been dissolved for a few thousand years to be reborn. And, and now that nation is thriving. They have their land. They have their city. They have their, 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 their government. The nation of Israel is thriving. The nation of Israel is surrounded by its enemies. Uh, people that would love to annihilate them and wipe them out, but yet they're, they're thriving in the midst of that. Uh, we know that the Jewish people have already drawn up plans to rebuild their temple. And, and that they desire, they're, they're ready, they have the money, they have the plans to rebuild that temple. They're just waiting on uh, the opportunity to build it because the Dome of the Rock, the Muslim temple sits on that place right now. So uh, they're waiting, but it, it, it's soon to happen. We, we know about the globalization of the world. We've, we've seen uh, globalization. We've, we've seen the world moving toward uh, a one-world currency and one-world economic system, e- even a one-world government system. All these prophecies that we read about are being literally fulfilled before our very eyes. And, and, and so the similarities are there. There is predictive pro- prophecy. There's precise fulfillment. And then there's also perfect timing. In, in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, when, when for many years the Jewish people had been waiting on their Messiah, waiting on the birth of, of the one who would be the Messiah, that for many years they waited, they waited, they waited. But in Galatians 4, verse 4, it says, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman. You see, God sent forth our Messiah, Jesus Christ, at the perfect time, when the fullness of of time had come. All the prophecies had been fulfilled. Everything was ready. And Jesus Christ was born. And and the Bible tells us that likewise, in Romans chapter 11, verse 25 through 26, the Bible says, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, my brothers, a partial hardening A partial partial hardening of hearts has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. Notice again the word fullness. When the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. You see, we've been waiting for a long time on the return of Jesus. You and I, we're anticipating it. We're waiting on it. And maybe it seems like it's been a long time. Just like the first coming, when people anticipated it, it seemed like it was a long time. And yet when the fullness of time came, everything started happening rapidly. Everything started happening in in fast order. Mary and Joseph and their trip to Bethlehem and the birth of Jesus and the arrival of the wise men and and, and everything started happening so quickly. Well, beloved, the same thing's going to happen at the second advent of Jesus Christ. We're going to be anticipating, 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 and we may wait for a long time, but when the fullness of time comes... In God's perfect timing, things are going to start happening rapidly. What may seem like has taken a long time, prophecies are going to start being fulfilled in rapid order. And and the, the advent, the second arrival of Jesus Christ is going to come. And so this morning, I want you to realize that though there are many similarities, there is one major difference, one big difference At the first advent of Jesus, he came to be our Savior. He came humbly. He came born in a manger. He came as a baby. He came to be a servant. He came to wash our feet. He he came to humbly serve and to die on a cross for our sins. But the second time Jesus comes, he's not coming as Savior. He's coming as the judge. He's not coming humbly, but he's coming boldly. He's coming on a white charger. And we're going to read about some of that this morning. In our text today, the Apostle John was given a vision 
of the resurrected and glorified Christ as he prepares for his second advent. He's there today. Our Lord Jesus is in heaven with God, the Father, preparing for the second advent. And the main thing I want to share with you today is that between the two advents, Jesus is working in our midst. We would say, well, what's Jesus doing now? Well, he's, he's in our midst. I want you to see that with me today. So would you take your copy of God's Word and stand with me to honor the reading of God's Word. And we're going to read Revelation chapter 1, verse 9 through 20. The Bible says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands was one like a son of man clothed with a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the voice, the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword and his face was like the sun burning in full strength. When I saw him... John said, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, for I am the first and the last, the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys to death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, the things that are, and the things which are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven Stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels, are the messengers of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus, your Son, who was born of a virgin, who came to a manger, who died on a cross for our sins who rose victoriously from the dead to new life, who ascended to the right hand of the Father, who right now is in heaven, and yet he's working in our midst today. He's in the midst of his churches. He's in the midst of his people. He is working among us until his second advent. And Father, we are looking forward to that day. Until then, may we join him in the work that he's doing And I pray that you would feed us and teach us from your word today. Give us ears to hear what your spirit would say to your church. In Jesus' name, amen. And so what I want you to see with me this morning in God's word is that between these two advents, Jesus is not dormant. (laughs) Jesus is not away at a, a long distance. But Jesus Christ is working in the midst of us. I want you to notice what we see in our text this morning. Leave your Bible open. We're going to camp out here in our text. Notice that he is in the midst of his churches. In in verse 9 through 13 and verse 20, John, who who, who now is the elder John, the oldest and last remaining disciple, uh, who lived through incredible times of persecution. He lived through the the reign of Nero and, and, and the persecution that Emperor Nero brought on the church. We talked about that some uh, a week ago. And, and now, uh, most scholars believe when he wrote the, wrote the book of Revelation, he was living during the reign of, of Roman Emperor Domitian. Domitian is the, the first that instigated a full-scale persecution against all believers, against all that were in the church. It became a, 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 a Roman Empire full-scale uh, onslaught of persecution on every believer. Many were martyred. Many were killed. I mean, he is writing to believers who are going through great suffering. 
And he's encouraging them to tell them, look, I know you're going through great trial, but Jesus is coming back. This same Jesus who died on the cross for our sins, who was raised from the dead, he's coming back. And the resurrection of Christ was great encouragement to them. They lived in readiness and anticipation, and they were excited about his coming. John 2 uh, was, was they attempted to martyr him. They boiled him in a cauldron of oil. And you can imagine, I can't even imagine the pain, but he survived it. And so uh, I guess there's, there's no double indemnity there. So they didn't kill him, but they banished him to a, a penal island, an island of prisoners that was called the island of Patmos. It was a, a, an island full of prisoners, harsh living. And it was there on this incredible island that John, the eldest, maybe in his 90s, he was in his 80s or 90s, John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Are you in the Spirit on the Lord's day? I mean, the Lord's day was what the New Testament church referred to as Sunday. Uh, Saturday was the Sabbath, but the New Testament church began to worship on what they called the Lord's Day, which was Sunday because that was the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And they wanted to distinguish themselves from the Judaism of the Jews. And and, and so even on an island of prisoners, what's John doing on Sunday? (laughs) He's worshiping the Lord. He is in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Beloved, that's what we should be every Sunday when we gather for church, we should number one be in the spirit, full of God's spirit, excited about worship, excited about prayer, excited about receiving God's word. We should be in the spirit on the Lord's day. And because he was in the spirit on the Lord's day, on a penal island, God showed up. And God gave him a glorious vision of the resurrected Christ in all of his glory. And we're going to see Jesus different than when we see him in the Christmas story. He's no longer a baby. He's no longer in a manger. He's no longer the suffering servant, but he's in the midst of his churches. And and the Bible tells us that in verse 12, that John turned to see the voice that was speaking. And he he, he saw these seven lampstands. And right in the middle of the lampstands was one like the Son of Man. Now, the Bible, when you read the book of Revelation, a lot of times you try to interpret it, and I like it because oftentimes it interprets itself. The book of Revelation will explain itself, and if you look back in verse 20, to understand what the seven lampstands are, he says, as for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my hand, they're the... The, and the seven lampstands, the seven stars are the messengers or the angels of the churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. These were seven specific churches that Jesus was going to write a letter to in the next two chapters, two and three. Jesus wrote a letter to those churches. But right now, John sees him where? In the midst of those churches. He's right there in the midst of the lampstand. And and those churches, the number seven is the number of completion, right? God, he created the universe, the world in seven days. And then he rested, right? There was, that was completion. And so not only are these seven specific churches just like our church, But these seven churches represent all the churches of all the ages. And Jesus Christ is right there in the midst of his churches. Beloved, today, where is Jesus? He's right here. He is in our midst. He is among us. You see, the reason that I love Sundays, I love to be on the Lord's Day, is because when we gather, Jesus Christ, Jesus among us, he is in our midst. The Bible tells us in Matthew 18, 20, Jesus said, Where two or more are gathered in my name, there I will be also. Now, when he said, there I will be also, what he meant is my manifest presence is going to be there. Beloved, Jesus Christ's manifest presence is in this very room. 
He is hearing our worship. He's attentive to what we're preaching. He's convicting our hearts. He's encouraging us when we suffer. He's drawing people to Christ. He's convicting us of our sin. He is right here in our midst. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, the the text we refer to as the Great Commission, where Jesus said to his church, here's what I want you to do. Go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to do everything I've commanded you. And then what was the last part of that? What was the last thing that he said? He said, and lo, I will what? Be with you always To the end of the age. He said, I will be with you. My manifest presence is going to be with my churches as they fulfill the mission that I have given them to do. I will be with you. He is in our midst. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 5, that that he is working among us. I I love this encouraging verse. He, he, He said, I will never leave you. Or forsake you. Beloved, Jesus is here. He loves you. He is with you. As he wrote these letters to the seven churches, you you see how intimate he is with them. To the church at Ephesus, he says, I know you. I know that you're a hard-working church. I know that you labor for me and you endure this persecution. He said, however, there's something else I know about you. That even though you're still working and laboring, enduring, here's what breaks my heart about you, Jesus said. You've lost your first love for me. You don't love me like you once did. At one time when you were saved, you, you loved me. You did everything you did out of love for me. And here's what I know now. You're just going through the motions. You're just going through the motions. And I'm in your midst. I know that about you. I'm right here. I'm present. I know that. And and unless you remember what it was like and you repent and return to that, he said, I'm going to take your light stand away. In other words, your light, your influence, your witness for me is going to go away. You see, that's intimacy. He knew those things. He wrote to the church at Sardis, and he said, I know you. I know that you have a reputation that you're alive. You have a reputation. Everybody thinks that you're a, you're a, you're a fired up believer. Everybody has a rep, you have a reputation that you are living for me and you're on fire for me. But here's what he said. He said, but I know this about you. You're dead. On the inside, you're spiritually dead. How's he know that? He's among them. He said to the church of Laodicea, he he said, listen, I mean, you may think you're something, but you're neither cold or hot. He said, I'd rather you be cold than lukewarm. And because you're lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. Do you get the picture? You see, Jesus is never far away. He's never distanced from us. He is right here in the midst of us. How does that make you feel today? I mean, is that, does that, does that make you want to just fall down on your knees? Or does it make you want to stand up and shout? Does it make you just want to reach out and grab hold of him? Because whether you are aware of it or not, and the sad reality is I think people come to church week in and week out, to churches all over, they're not aware that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is right here in our midst. Notice the second thing. He is in the midst of his churches, but number two, he ministers as a priest to his people. Look at verse 13. It says that in the midst of the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe, with a golden sash around his chest. The robe, the the golden sash were the garments of, of a high priest. And we see the high priestly role of our Lord and and Savior, Jesus Christ. He ministers among us as our great high priest. He ministers. When you read the letters to the seven churches, there's one phrase 
that you read in all seven letters. He says, I know you. I know you. I know you. Intimate knowledge. You see, Jesus is ministering to us today and he knows you. He knows if you're here today and you're going through a, a, an incredible time of trial and maybe a time of grief and a time of suffering. He knows the fears and anxieties that you're going through. He knows the, the pain of, of, of broken relationships. He knows the, the heartache that, that some of you are going through. He knows. There's nothing that our great high priest does not know about us. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 through 16, look at these great verses. He, the writer of Hebrews says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. In other words, let us keep the faith. Let us hold fast the faith. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every way, in every aspect, has been tempted and tried as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Oh, hallelujah. Beloved church, that's Jesus' invitation to you. That's the great high priest invitation to you. Do you realize because Jesus Christ is our great high priest that we do not need anyone else to give us access to God the Father and the throne of God? You don't need a human priest to stand between you and God. You, you have access to the Creator, to God the Father, through Jesus Christ, who is our great high priest. And He invites you to come boldly before His throne of grace. Why? That you might find help. In your time of need. Oh, what a blessed and glorious invitation that is. We can come before him with our prayers. We can come right into his presence. And he loves us and we find help. But not only can we go into his presence and pray, but he prays for us. Our great high priest intercedes for us. In Hebrews 7, 25... The Bible says, consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. You see, you have somebody that's always praying for you. I'm sure you may have more than one. You may have people that are praying for you. You may have a friend, a spouse who's praying for you. But can I tell you, you've got somebody greater that's praying for you every day, you know who that is? That's Jesus Christ. He is in our midst, and he lives to make intercession for us. He is on your side. He's always praying for you. And we can come before his throne of grace. It's interesting, I think in chapter 4, we get to, we get to see the throne of grace. I think in chapter 4 is where we see the rapture of the church take place. If you, turn, if you want to read it real quick, turn over a page. It says, after this, I looked, behold, a door standing open in heaven. After this is after the church age, after the complete church age. I looked, there was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice said, uh, it said, come up here. Come up here and I'll show you what must take place after this. Beloved, I believe that's us. That one of these days, there's going to be a voice that says, hey, come on up here. And in the twinkling of an eye, immediately you and I are going to come up there. I mean, we're going to be translated from earth to heaven in the twinkling of an eye. We're going to be caught up together with our loved ones in the cloud. We'll always be with the Lord. And it's going to happen just like that. It's going to happen just come up here. 
and, and we're going to be in heaven. What's the first thing we're going to see? It says, at once. He said, at once I was in the Spirit. Behold, a throne. <laughs> I mean, the, the immediately after the rapture of the church, he said, behold, a throne. Now, this is not the great white throne of judgment. He, he says, there was one who set up on it like a jasper, a carnelian. Around the throne was a rainbow. A rainbow. This is not the great white throne judgment. This is the throne that is sitting on a crystal sea that has a rainbow above it where all the saints are gathered to worship him. This is the throne of grace. And that throne of grace is where God is right now and it's where he hears our prayers. It's where he intercedes for us. And when we get to be in heaven, we're going to see that beautiful throne of grace where myriad of myriad of myriads of prayers have been answered, where miracles have been performed at the bequest of God. Oh, glory. Are you guys okay today? I mean, I would think you, some of you would be shouting by now, all right? Are you all awake? This is good stuff. All right, y'all stay with me, all right? So he ministers as our great high priest. Not only that, but he knows us. The church at Smyrna... He said, I know you. I know that you're going through tribulation and poverty. But he said, but you are rich. Wow. He said, you don't realize how rich you really are. Because their tribulation and their poverty as a church had driven them closer to God. Their tribulation and their poverty had, had resulted in, in them drawing near that throne of grace, in them drawing near to God. And God says, you may think that you're, you're poor, you may think you're, po you're po in poverty, but I want to tell you, this is my appraisal, you are rich. Love it, sometimes... When we are going through the trials of life and, and we draw near to God, we don't realize how rich we are. We don't realize how awesome it is to, to see that we have been, that our trials have been used by God to draw us near to Him. Well, the third thing, not only is He in the midst of the churches, He ministers as a priest to His people, but third, He makes ready for the judgment on His enemies. Verse 14 says that the hairs of his head were white like wool, white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held the seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. Not only is he a, a great priest, but he's a judge. And when it speaks of the purity of his, his hair, the purity of, of his radiant face, his eyes were like flames of fire. He's no longer a baby in a manger, but he is a, a lion. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is a judge that's getting ready to bring judgment upon his enemies. The Bible tells us in John Chapter 5, verse 22, that Jesus said, The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son. This very description that John saw of Jesus, Daniel, many years before the first advent of Christ, saw the same vision. Daniel said in Daniel 7, verse 9 and 10, he said, as I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days, that was Daniel's way of referring to the Son of Man, the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow. The hair of his head was pure like wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand ten thousands stood before him. And the court said in judgment, and the books were opened. Wow! Daniel saw that. Daniel saw the same thing that John is seeing. And he said when he sat down on that other throne, this is the great white throne, he said the books were open. You see, this same Jesus who came as a baby is coming back 
In Revelation 19, it tells us that he's not coming on a donkey riding humbly in, into Jerusalem to die, but he's coming on a white charger. That, that he has a robe that's dripped in blood, that his eyes are like flames of fire, that out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword with which he will judge the nations. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 20, if you look at verse 12 and verse 15, after the seven years of tribulation, after the rapture of the church, the dead in Christ will be risen. Those that are dead without Christ... Those that are dead without him will also be risen. You see, if you die without the Lord, you, you're not extinguished. You're going to live at forever too. Everybody has eternal life. You, you either have eternal life with God in heaven or you have eternal life with the devil in a place called hell. Everybody lives eternally. No, nobody is, is extinguished. And, and, and the dead that died without Christ will, will be risen in their bodies, and they will stand before him. And the Bible says in Revelation 20, verse 12, I saw the dead, the spiritually dead, great and small, standing before the throne. This is not the throne of grace. This is the great white throne. And he says, and books were opened. Daniel said the same thing. He said, the, the court was set and the books were opened. Now, what are these books, plural? The books, plural, are a record of every sin that you and I have ever committed. Every single secret sin, every sin of thought, deed, action, every sin that we've ever done. God keeps a record of all of our sins. And if you and I desire to stand before God and receive a fair trial, He will give us one. And many people think, well, if I live a good life, I'm going to get into heaven. I can promise you, you won't. That, that no matter how good we live, that, that, that no one will ever be able to enter into heaven with sin in their life. And we have more sins than we could ever imagine. It takes plural books to contain all of our sins. And, and God has a record of every single one. And during the great white throne judgment, if you die without Christ, you will stand before the judge and, and he will give you a record of all the sins and explain to you why you cannot enter into heaven and why the wages of sin is death and has always been death and why you must spend an eternity separated from God. If you want a fair trial, God will give you one. But I love this other part. It says that not only were the books were opened, it says then there was another book open, which is the book of life. And the dead, the spiritually dead without Christ, were judged by what was written in the books, plural, according to what they had done. But you jump down to verse 15, it says, And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. <laughs> All right, come in here with me, beloved church. You see, the first advent of Jesus Christ is all about the fact that Christ came to die for sinners. And when he died on the cross, he died for your sins. He paid the price so that if you believe in him and put your faith in him, he will forgive you all your sins. He not only forgives them, but he removes them as far as the east is from the west. He buries them in the depths of the sea. They will be remembered no more. And so for every one of us who have put our faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we will receive no condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. You see, God has given us a free pardon. We have the free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The books that contained all of our sin for a believer, they're buried in the depths of the sea. They will be remembered no more. The only thing that matters to us is the book singular. And the only thing that's in the book singular that's called the Lamb's Book of Life is your name. That's the only thing that's in there. No record of sin, no record of wrong, no record of anything you've ever done. Just your precious name. He knows your name. He has saved you. He's written your name in his book of life. And hell and Satan and death can't touch you. 
You are forgiven. You are pardoned. You have the blessed assurance of eternal life in heaven. And there's nothing you did to receive that. It's all about what Jesus Christ did for you. You simply trusted him by faith. And you see, for every person that is alive, you're either going to be judged by the books, plural, or you're going to get a free pardon because your name is in the one book that matters the most, the Lamb's Book of Life. Hallelujah, right? Is your name in that book? I pray that your name is in that book. Anyone's name not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life was thrown into the lake of fire. He makes ready for judgment on his enemies. They may mock us now. They may persecute us now. They may live lives of rebellion now. But one of these days, they're going to stand before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And the Bible tells us every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But it will be bowing in judgment, not in salvation, at the great white throne. The last thing, and we close with this. He not only is in the midst of his churches, he ministers a priest to his people. He makes ready for judgment on his enemies. But but fourth, he has a message for his servants. In verse 17, John said, when I saw all this, I fell at his feet as though I was dead. That's what I would do, right? I mean, if I saw this, I would fall at his feet as dead. And yet Jesus said to him, fear not. Oh, what precious words. He said, fear not, John. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I died, and behold, I live forevermore, and I have the keys of death and hell. In other words, he says, I'm the only way. You either get into heaven or you will spend eternity in hell. I have the keys. Nobody gets to decide who gets in except the one who has the keys, right? Only the one with the keys. He's the authority. Nobody else gets to make that decision. A lot of people think, oh, well, there's many ways to God. There are not many ways to God. There is only one way to God, only one way to heaven, only one way to forgiveness, and that one way is through Jesus Christ, the living one who died and is alive forevermore. He holds the keys, Nobody else has those keys. He is the only one that has the keys to eternal life. And he said to John, he said, John, I need you to write. He says, get up. The things that you have seen, write them. The things that are and the things that are going to take place, write. In other words, get the message out, John. Share the good news Write about the judgment. The world needs to know. Don't be afraid. It reminds me of the fear not of the Christmas story, right? In, in, in Luke 2, verse 10 through 12, the angel said to the shepherds, Fear not. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Beloved, we can find him today. He's accessible today. Today he is our Savior. Today Jesus is the Savior. He's working in our midst. If you're here without Jesus, you've never been saved. He is in our midst. He is convicting you that yes, you are a sinner. He is drawing you to put your faith in his gift of eternal life in heaven. You have a choice to make. It's your choice. You either accept him or you reject him. That's your choice. And if you spend your life separated from God in a place called hell, that's on you. You made that choice. That's not on God. God did everything, moved everything there is on heaven and earth to save your soul. To give you a free pardon, to forgive your sins, to reconcile you to God. If you spend eternity in hell, you will spend eternity realizing this is on me. I made this choice. And beloved, our job, like John, is to write, to tell, to share the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
I heard a story, an illustration about three apprentice demons who were being trained how to tempt mankind. And there was an experienced demon that was training them. And, and one of the demons of the three came and said, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell the people on earth there is no hell. And, 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 and the older demon said, well, you're not going to be very successful. Most people are living through hell right now. They, they know there's a hell. They believe in hell. Another demon said, well, I'm going to tell them that there is no heaven, that there's no eternal life with God. And, and, and that demon, that was the older demon, said, well, you're not going to be very successful either. Because most of those humans down there, they want to believe in heaven. They believe in heaven. Well, the third apprentice demon came and said, well, I've got an idea. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell people on earth that they have plenty of time. And the wise old demon said, go, go. You are going to be successful. Many people will be brought into our kingdom because of your message that they have time. Beloved, we don't know how much time. Just as there were many people living in anticipation for the first advent, and it seemed like a long time in coming, but when the fullness of time came, everything started to happen fast. Everything started happening rapidly. I mean, everything moved miraculously, and Jesus was born. Well, we've been waiting for the second advent for a long time, Jesus in our midst. But when the fullness of time comes again, everything's going to start happening rapidly, very quickly. And, and many people are going to run out of time. I pray today that you, ready and that you are living with all your heart for the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me? Would you bow your heads with me? Would you just stand before the Lord who's in our midst? If Jesus were to come today, are you ready to meet him? Are you really? You see, religion doesn't make you ready. Living good life doesn't make you ready. It's only when you've repented and bowed your knees to Jesus are you ready. I pray that you would do that today. For those of you who know that Jesus is coming, are you sharing him? Are you telling others about him? Are your friends ready? Are your neighbors ready? Are your work associates ready? What are you doing to help them be ready? Oh, Heavenly Father, God, everything in this word is true. And you've proven to be faithful to everything you promised, God. We saw all that in the first advent. And we're getting ready to see it in the second one as well. God, I pray that everyone in this room is ready to meet our master. If there's someone here that's not ready, I pray right now, oh, Heavenly Father, that they would call upon your name. That they would confess their sin. That they would call on the name of Jesus to save them. For those of us who are ready... Oh, God, have we lost our first love? Do we have a reputation that we're alive but we're dead? Have we become lukewarm? Oh, God, may it never be. Lord, I pray today that we do whatever it takes to get our love back for you, our light back for you, get to be hot for you again. Lord, to be sharing with others. Lord, let us renew our faith and be faithful to the end because you are worthy. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.